listening to the MPI Paranormal Podcast, where the truth is to be found. A podcast exploring all things paranormal, hauntings, UFOs, crypto, the unknown. Our members believe in the skeptical approach, but with an open mind, just trying to make sense of it all. I want to get back in there, try to figure that out, because it is the unknown. I don't really have a say on it right now, because I don't know what the video looks like. I'm looking for the evidence. What's the evidence? A story to me is not really evidence, because that's one person's experience. Right. And I do, I take my personal beliefs into it, but like you said, then I have my skeptical side that right. wants to prove it another way. Military Paranormal Investigations is not affiliated to any branch of the military. It's time. Coming to you from North Texas on multiple platforms for maximum reach. Here are your hosts, members of the MPI team. And welcome to Military Paranormal Investigations Podcast. My name is Rob. I'm Mike. I'm Allison. And, uh, and go ahead, Mike. Welcome to the show. I um, first wanted to start by saying you can always find us on militaryparanormal.com or on our Facebook at Military Paranormal, Twitter at MPI underscore paranormal, Instagram, YouTube, Face- <laughs> Facebook. And how about that streaming stuff today, Rob? Where are we where are we going with that? Oh, good lord, streaming! I'm uh, oh, don't even get me started. We have been trying to do this thing for I don't know how long now. <laughs> A little over an hour trying to push the feed. Oh, so all we're gonna do is pre-record this one. Uh, we were hoping for a really good episode. As you can see, we don't have Jeff here tonight, uh, so we do want to give a shout out to Jeff. It's his birthday, so happy birthday, Jeff! Happy birthday, bud! Happy birthday, Jeff! We would tell you his age, but no, he'd, he'd get kind of upset about that one. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll just let him celebrate. But yeah, he's having a good time with his family stuck at home today, so he's just we're just letting him enjoy that while he's while he's spending time with his family. Exactly. So you hit all of our social media sites, Mike. What about the streaming sites? Do you know any of them that we're possibly going to be pushing on? Uh, we'll be going to Facebook Live, YouTube, and uh, Mixer, Twitch, DLive, Mob Crush. And Periscope, which is Twitter as well. So. Look at you. You know them all, don't you? <laughs> hey, I actually got my outline all up today. Okay, cool. Uh, don't forget, you can also contact us at podcast at militaryparanormal.com. Uh, .com, and you can also contact us at 940-437-4674. That would be 4MPI at the end. All right. And also, I, I know Mike can't see this one, but I'm putting it out there. Allison can't see it either. But I made a new background, and if you look, everyone is under their own. So, Mike, I did a shout-out to your uh, website with the um, Undiscovered Origins. Of course, we have MPI right in the middle, Allison representing that. And I've also, if you've noticed, I have a new uh, Facebook page that I've started as well. Don't have anything out there now, but it's called uh, Paranormal... Uh, road rider so you can find me on that one as well all right i know we're going to talk about that a little later on in the show there so yeah we'll get back to that so okay well so go for it <laughs> i guess today our topic is the men in black that's right and we got some little sound going on right now so <laughs> all right hey, I, can't a little bit of in black. I know you can't hear it but it's in there I, uh, which I do love that movie. Uh, there are all, all of those movies. Yes. They, you know, very sci-fi-ish, but I, I, there are some of my favorite movies as far as, as uh, the alien stuff goes. Mm-hmm. I think they're so. Which I like Will Smith a lot. I like Tommy Lee Jones a lot. So I think they're great. But, Have you seen the new one yet? Um, what do you mean by new one? What am I, I missing? Something. The International. I don't guess I have. Uh, yeah, the guy that uh, played uh, Thor is now. Heading up, he heads oh, up over yeah, in the uh, yeah. yeah. He heads up over in the uh, UK division. Okay, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. tonight no, we're, we're actually... going to get a little more yes. on the real level. We're going to talk a little bit about the history, where it came from, where the origins of the Men in Black came right. from, and uh, kind of 
get into that a little bit. And then on the second half of the show, we're going to come back and talk about our opinions, kind of what maybe some of the leading theories today are, uh, kind of go from there. And I also have a recording of a personal event of someone that claims they've probably seen the men in black. They really don't know. Um, we're not going to play it right here. I'll edit in at post as well. So that would be pretty interesting. Yeah, I'm pretty excited to hear that. I haven't heard it either, so I think that ought to be pretty interesting. All right, so do you want to start off with the – who wants to go with the how it actually started? Well, I think probably the first – some of the first cases that came out. Uh, 1947 mm-hmm. was Harold Dahl and Fred uh, – is it Chrisman, I think, how you say yeah, it? Yeah, I believe it's Chrisman at the Murray Island in Washington State. And – there's actually, we pulled a lot of information from this from the actual FBI database, I guess. Yeah. You know, they actually have the vault, which they call it. And it's not to be confused with the Black Vault, which is another really good website where there's a lot of this stuff up. But, um, you know, they have a website there where you can go pull up a lot of these informations that they've gotten a lot of, like, FOIA requests and stuff over the years on. And you can actually go look at some of this documentation, which is really, really, really interesting. We'll have a link down in the description right. in the if show you want to go check out some of that. And... um it, it, it's it's kind of really interesting. Um, I thought I was up. doing the research. I really did. That I went through seven pages of those FBI files. There's actually 16, but seven of those pages actually talk about what we're going to talk about with the Harold Dahl. Um, cons- well, I, I don't want to say conspiracy right now, but story. How about that? Right, story. Yeah, because, I mean, I think it started out, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll get into it because – it could have very much well been a conspiracy to kind of promote uh, their information at the time because later on they go on to produce some pretty popular yes. uh, websites and such. So, But basically June 21st of 1947, um, they were out – and I'm trying to – they were – weren't they in like a um, – it was like a salvage operation or something. What they had to do is move logs. Um, they were part of a logging thing. And they had to move the logs down the river, the ones that would get stuck. So they had the boats there to move them in to keep them going down the channel, down the river. And we're getting some comments on our Facebook page. So is that pushing live? No. <laughs> I, uh, no. I'm getting a bunch of comments come across. I'm going to try to get to that. If you want to start telling that story, I'm going to see if I can take okay. care of our yeah, group you... there. So. Oh, wow. Yeah, there's – okay. Um, yeah, it wouldn't connect. Um, okay, so, uh, like he was saying, on June 21st, they were in a boat, a uh, patrol boat, with two men, and Dawes' son and his dog. Uh, around about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, um, Dawes' boat uh, started approaching the east shore of the Murray Island. Now, Murray Island is attached to what they call the Vashoon Islands. It's like a bunch of different islands down in Washington State. That is caused uh, a by a causeway road. Uh, it's about six miles west of Des Moines, Washington. Now they said Dahl looked in the sky and saw six objects floating, and about two thousand feet above his ship. The objects were made of some reflective material, donut shaped, and about one hundred feet in diameter. The center holes were about twenty five feet in diameter. Dahl said he saw a round po- porthole. And what he thought was an observation window. Five of the craft had circled over the sixth, which dropped suddenly or slowly. Um, A big difference between slowly and suddenly, huh? (laughs) So it dropped slowly. It stopped and hovered about 500 feet above the water. Dahl put to shore because he was afraid the center uh, aircraft was going to crash into his boat. And once he was ashore... Oh, I lost it. Lost my stop. There we yeah, go. that's some little writing. Here we go. Yeah, it is. Uh, once ashore, Dahl took several pictures in his camera. The lower ship stayed in position for about five minutes with the other circling above. One of the ships left the formation and moved down, touching the lower ships. The two kept contact for several minutes until Dahl saw, said he heard a thud. Suddenly... Thousands of pieces of what he thought were newspaper drops, droppings from the inside of the center of the ship. Most of the debris landed in the bay, though some of it hit the beach where, where Dahl was able to recover a few pieces. 
finding it finding it was a oh finding it was easy because it was a white light white material along the beach um and there was a bunch of uh thin strips of the white metal that dropped about 20 he said dropped about 20 tons of a dark metal which he said yeah, kettle like, they said was like lava rock yeah exactly that clear stuff really smooth probably for from it um being so hot because that's basically what lava rock would do is yeah and they said it was so hot that when the when those lava rock like items would hit the water they would steam and, and create bubbling in the water so did but you get they, those uh comments I, I i answered to it jeff actually commented on there and then um thank miss sandy lopez put commented on there but she said she missed us and uh I told them that we will still be recording and pushing the feeds a little bit. Yeah, later we'll on. we'll push it later on tonight. So, <laughs> but so, and when that stuff was hitting the water, of course, the steam was coming up, mm -hmm. and then they um there was pieces that landed in the in the boat, and actually a couple of the pieces they hit his son on one arm and burnt him pretty badly. He ended up having yeah. to go to the doctor, and it killed their dog. Yeah, exactly. The um. After they did all that, the the UFOs kind of headed back out to sea, and then they they tried to get um, they went back into the boat and tried to get uh, radio to call for help, but the radios wouldn't work. So then they went back out and they they dropped the dog out to sea, kind of buried the dog at sea, and then um, took his son to the hospital. And then when that happened, they actually showed. Um, the camera photos to Chrisman and they actually showed the strange airships. However, they didn't believe them. And the negatives, um, the negatives had like signs of radiation mm -hmm. exposure to them. They actually looked burnt and, and stuff like that. And when they actually went back out to the site and supposedly gathered up some more of the samples and excuse me, <clears throat> That's when they started gathering. That's when the ships apparently came back. Right. So when they were out there doing that, then the UFOs supposedly came back in. And here's where the men in black come into play, though. So he went back in and gave a detailed account of what was going on. And when that happened, these men in black suits showed up and warned him that bad things would happen well, to I him and his was, family. If I'm not mistaken, it was only one man at the time. Only one man showed up um, wearing a black suit. The first and, day. And he, right. And then he warned them that if they told anybody or said anything about it, that bad things would happen to him and his family. Mm -hmm. And he, I guess no, he told him he wanted to go to breakfast is what it was. So they, when he went, they drove their own cars and the guy was driving the typical black Buick is what they said in the, in the, in the, the story. Right. But it was like a new, a new black Buick. The guy was in a black suit, which is where you start getting some of that, um, what do you call it? The kind of the lore of men in black. They're driving the black cars and the black mm -hmm. suits and things like that. Right. And he said that the guy, when they went to breakfast, they, they didn't, the guy didn't really say anything, but other than giving him a story of actually what was going to happen, what the, what doll's story was going to be. Basically he told him what he was going to say that his story was instead of talking about the pieces falling or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, it was right after that, that I'm trying to, if I'm not mistaken, so um, wasn't it a few weeks later? Cause this happened around what the 21st and 22nd, right? Right. Oh, okay. And, and then a few weeks later, they sent a package, your, right? Right. And they contacted, uh, Oh, the Chicago, Palmer. Yeah, uh, from uh, yeah, the Chicago they paper. Kenneth Arnold. What's that? No, keep going. Oh, no, they contacted Ray Palmer in Chicago because they were trying to get the story pushed. Um, and then Palmer uh, later founded that Fate magazine thing. But the package contained a bunch of the actual metal that fell from the sky from the ship. And Palmer is the one that contacted Keith Arnold, the same right. guy that was seeing uh, flying saucers at uh, Mount Rainer, 
believe. Yep. He, yeah. yeah, he's the one that had the, the sightings that uh, they, they kind of circled his airplane as he was going. And he's the one that they say coined the term flying saucer, although he didn't actually say saucer in his description. He called him, I forget what it is, he called him something else. But I can't remember either. But didn't Arnold come... Did Arnold come down there to meet them? I can't remember. Yeah, they had. He came down and um, trying to follow up my notes here, man. You wrote this in the smallest font possible. <laughs> you know, you can if you're looking at it on a computer. You can enlarge it. Go to the view button. Oh no, I can't. I can go to the zoom. Do a hundred and fifty. All right, so basically it says that the two of them met with Dahl because it had uh, Arnold came in with another airline pilot named E.J. Smith. And then they met with Dahl and Chrisman and basically examined Dahl's boat and they conducted interviews themselves so they could kind of see what was going on. Um, however, they didn't have the pictures at the time because, like you said, the negatives were kind of messed up. So they didn't have any pictures of anything. Um... And then Dahl also told Arnold that his son had disappeared. Yeah, and he could go back later on and said that, well, he found him waiting tables somewhere right. in Montana, he, but he didn't know how he got there. Exactly. But that, actually, connected. but that actually kind of rings true with some later on sightings where, where people say that the men in black kind of erase memories and mm -hmm. change, which is because so the movie, of course, they have the neuralizers, right. which, but there's some things about that where they, they don't remember events that happened when they've had people don't remember other events that have happened when they've had an encounter with the men in black, which is probably where the movie picks up on that little bit of lore as well. Probably. Yeah. And then probably about a month later, because this happened in June, right? So the end of July, beginning of August, uh, two air force officers came in to, to the picture, a captain Lee Davison and a first Lieutenant Frank Brown of the United States army air force. But, 47, yeah, okay. Uh, actually, it was probably the Army Air Corps at the time. It was. It was the Army Air Corps. Yeah, it wasn't the Army, yeah, Army Air Corps at the time. And they that'll play into, that'll take in, come into account here at, in a little bit, so. Exactly. Um, oh, I but they, one. not only were they pilots, they were also intelligence specialists as well, which kind of leads into the whole, you know, the men in black being like special operatives, if you will. Mm -hmm. So you're saying Captain Lee and, um, or Captain Davidson and, and Lieutenant Brown were. Not only were they pilots, they were also intelligence specialists. Yeah. Okay. Cause I know they met with Arnold, um, Smith and Christmas for like several hours in like a hotel. And one of the officers said that he thought that there might've been something to the story, but they had to leave around midnight. They're in a hurry to be at Hamilton Field around August 1st, the day when the Air Force was, yeah, to split from the Army. See, I knew it was the Army Air Corps. <laughs> um, the two officers flew out to McCord Airfield around 2 o'clock in the morning on a B-25 bomber with a crew of two other airmen. Now, uh, the other airmen, one of them was just a hitchhiker airman getting a hop, and the other one was actually the flying crew chief. Okay. I found that out too, which is where it comes to the story later on as well. But it ended up crashing, mm -hmm. and when the plane started to started to have issues, the enlisted guys bailed out. Right. They and then the. Sorry. No, no, no. I remember yeah, we're, so gonna, we're gonna guys talk bailed over out. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> the, the enlisted guys bailed out, but right. the other um, Brown and Davidson actually crashed with the, with the aircraft and were killed. Right. And I found out, um, doing some more research, that what happened is that the two enlisted were able to grab the parachutes along with the officers. They grabbed the parachutes too, but right after the enlisted, the wing broke off and threw it into a big spin. So the other two officers got thrown into the tail section, and they couldn't make it to the, the jump chute, which is why they went down. Gotcha. Which, again kind of comes into play as a big conspiracy theory. Exactly. The um, people said that they heard anti-aircraft guns mm -hmm. when the plane, right before the plane crashed. 
Um, so that was kind of a story that a lot of newspapers and, and re- the reason I believe the FBI it was investigating, but then people started saying that they were doing that to cover up the story. So you're saying that the FBI launched their own investigation be- to cover up everything? Um, well, that's where some of the theories end up going. But, okay. but whenever once the once the pilots died, the Air Force, of course, they took on the investigation a little more seriously. So they sent more people, and then the FBI also launched an investigation because of everything that was going on around with it. Right. But the Air Force, of course, said that what you were saying about the tailspin and there was a fire, some, some issues, the engine caught fire, the plane went down and then it, it crashed. The, I guess the stories that they, what they were saying is, is when the FBI came into, they said that the, the pieces of metal on the, on the, they said the same thing that the air force did. And then they said that like they went and investigated the boat mm-hmm. and the damage to the boat. And they were saying that their stories were inconsistent and they couldn't find any metal on the, on the beach. Right. Um, and so what they said is that they, they said that the samples that were there looked like slag from a metal smelter, kind of maybe from some steel production or something like that. And that, they basically wrote it. They came up with this story in order to have publicity for a magazine article. Which, again, later on, one of the other characters in the story goes on to produce Fate Magazine, which was one of the leading paranormal conspiracy magazines for many, 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 many years. Right. And so they, the FBI, when they when they came out and said that, they they told them that that their hoax basically wasn't going to go over. And if they dropped the matter, the government wouldn't prosecute them for fabricating um, a fraud. Because it and, resulted in the death of those two officers. Right. So that, because their story was fraudulent and the if officers came out to investigate, then they died. Mm-hmm. But if they backed off of their story, they wouldn't prosecute them for the death of the two officers, which is kind of, I mean, I get where they were going with that, but they're, it's almost like they use that at that point in time to say, right. "Hey, quit telling your story," because they, yeah, they could, exactly. if, yeah. If they if they wanted to pursue the matter even further, they could have said, "Hey, well, no, they were out here investigating because this is what we found." Um, but again, at the time too, we've talked about this in the past too. At the time too, the government wasn't seen so much like it is nowadays with everything being conspiracy or political. At that point in time, coming off of World War II. Our government was, you know, in high esteem. Right. So, I, you know, there was a different mindset in people back during that time. And so basically they came out and said that they, they, they came out and said, hey, our stories were fake. Um, and then they quit giving interviews to anybody. And then but later on, I, yeah, uh, I was about January say, later of on, 1950. They- uh, Chrisman came out and said that the innocent incident did happen. Mm-hmm. And Kenneth Arnold. um mentioned Maury Allen in his 52 book, the coming of saucers, which was about his story um, of what we, you know, what he witnessed there over Mount Rainier. And most people today believe that Crispin and Dahl, they, they faked it. And then they started a hoax to kind of get some publicity. And then it just snowballed and went out of hand. But a lot of other people believe that the government was behind a conspiracy and it could have been UFOs to, uh, what they might have actually seen was dumping of nuclear waste in Puget Sound. Right. Uh, that's what they were dropping out of these ships, which doesn't make any sense to me because we didn't have any, I mean, unless they were really um, like airships or something that was hauling this out. I mean, what, what we would, didn't have anything. No. Right. That's what I mean. What kind of aircraft would we have had that would have, would have gone into that. But, Nothing, but they believe that the government sabotaged the bomber to get rid of the investigators, and right. then they would blame Dahl and Chrisman in order to have them drop their story. And that's basically where I was talking about earlier on that deal, right? Which is probably why they kept saying that the men in black were the ones that were saying, Don't you're, you're gonna forget this, and then to tie it in with his son, never know, yeah, yeah, so. 
Allison, you're quiet. What? Yeah. I'm listening. I am I am learning. I am learning. There there's so much there's so much stuff on this. It, it you know, this is kind of where it starts, but there's so much stuff that really goes in it. If you really went off in a rabbit hole on this, oh, good it gets Lord. really, really, really deep. So I don't even want to talk about the Space Brothers. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's, there, there's a tremendous <laughs> amount of stuff on this. And and that's earlier, you know, I'm trying to I want to make sure I try to get some of the the story straight. Um, but, you know, to, to not mislead, but right. there's so much stuff that it's kind of hard to keep track of some of that at times. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Especially with it going um, back and forth with them saying that they were trying to do it. And then they sent the story to Chicago to try and get publicity. And then they started this fundraising thing. Yeah. I don't know. It's different. So there was, I wanted to pull up this. Let me see if I can pull this up. It, probably the most popular of the Men in Black originators was Albert Bender. Yeah, he was the victim of the silence group, right? Right. And so basically, in 1952, Albert Bender formed a group called the International Flying Saucer Bureau, which is IFSB. Mm -hmm. And I think this was kind of in response to a lot of stuff that was going on with like Project Blue Book and yes. some of those things. So some of the earlier, and my mind is blank right now, but some of the earlier um, conceptions of that group. And so he joined this more as a public thing to kind of get, I guess, more information out there. And it, it took off. I mean, people were turning in stories and doing all this sort of stuff. And then all of a sudden, a year later, he just shut it down. And then basically he comes out and says that basically the reason he shut it down is that these three men in black had came to him and told them basically everything there was to know about the UFO mystery, what was going on, what the real story was behind it. But then they turned his, they, they just turned his world upside down and they, you know, they threatened him. And I guess, didn't they, I think they threatened maybe yeah, they, some of his family. Yeah. They threatened everything. Uh, and, threatened his company that that group that he did the people in the group they, they were threatening everybody which is why he probably he just left it he couldn't take it no more he just left and um i think he came out you know later on and 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 kind of talked about it some more later on in life but then he had like another men in black mm -hmm. episode or something to it um and I don't know, you said you didn't want to talk about the Space Brothers, but... Well, I mean, <laughs> the Space Brothers well, but... in themselves could be... I mean, it ha for those of you who don't know, Space Brothers is a race of different aliens from the different planets, such as Venus, Mars, and Earth. And it was like a coalition of them trying to protect Earth from... Um, pretty much destroying itself. And that's where the Space Brothers come into play. So everyone is trying to deny that's ever happening. Basically what I really didn't want to get into, but right. it's, it's a, I don't know. that Those start getting in some of the more far-fetched yeah. theories of it. But I do think that, um, I'm, I do want to back up just a second. Okay, but go for it. In 1975, uh, ufologist John Keel wrote the, wrote a very popular book. He did, yes. And this is probably where the term "men in black" was coined from. I think this is probably one of the more important ones. I mean, because if you're into the paranormal and you don't know who John Keel is, there's uh, you, you need to yeah, you definitely read the book. Yeah, you definitely want to look into some of that. But do you do you know what the book was called, Allison? Do you want to take a guess? It's a very popular movie. Uh, Men in Black? <laughs> <laughs> Not that one. And I don't, I don't know if you've seen this one, but it's the Mothman Prophecies. Oh, no. Um, so that's where, you know, John Keel kind of coined the term Men in Black, I guess, put it out more in print and some of his books and things, and that's where the term Men in Black actually came mm -hmm. from. But yeah, John Keel probably was most, most widely known in the general spectrum of things by being the author of the Mothman prophecies, which came out later. And what, who was that in that movie? That was, um, 
my mind is I can see his Richard, face. Richard Greer. Uh, Greer? Richard Gear. Yeah. Yes, Richard Gear. And uh anyway, great movie if you haven't ever seen yes. that. Yes. Good good um, depiction of the history of the bridge going down. Great. I I enjoyed that movie completely. It's a uh, so then after all of this came out in, in the, that was in the seventies, there was a lot of talk about the men in black as that went on. And then in the eighties, it just really took off. And that's more where of more of the, um, space brothers kind of came out. Yeah. Um, the and, and that, <laughs> is I guess what they call them. The sauce. Yeah. They were the saucerines. Weren't they were the ones, the enforcers of the, uh, silence group. Um, I'm not going to lie. I can't remember which one. Um, let me see if I got it in the notes here. Yeah, they were associated with the international banking interest to that group. Um, they sought to stifle the techno- techno- technological advances and uh, uh, reform the Space Brothers wanted to bestow on the Earthlings. So basically, the Space Brothers wanted to give us all these things, and they didn't want us to have them. Right. But, I mean, now, do you remember how the... What was the deal about the Greys with the they were the Greys came later and the Space Brothers were trying to protect us from, from them. the Greys that- because the Greys what they said and this I believe his name was John Lear. Um but the Greys apparently came down to try to control us, study us, and even eat us. So that's where the Space Brothers were trying to protect us because in order to get the technology, the Greys gave us technology, and then in return, we, the president, and I, I, I for some reason, it, Truman just comes out, but I don't think it was Truman, um, gave the Greys permission to abduct human beings, do experiments on them, and even eat some of them. To So that's where that came about with the Greys. Um, there, there's a bunch of stories with the grays, but we, that, that's the one that sticks to my mind. Well, see, and that's, that's kind of part, I think it was Truman. And then, and that's where, um, the, um, the base in New Mexico in the mountains. Um, oh, you're talking about Roswell? Uh, the, no, 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 no. no oh, um, oh, on the other side of area 51. Yes. Oh. Well, my, my, my mind is like, I'll remember in just a second, but yes, that's where they, have the underground base. Yes, yes. And that's where they do the experiments. There's been stories come out of the, you know, come out of there. But yes, that's where. So the where they came out of that is. So there are stories of men in black not only being in like black suits and being like FBI agents, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of stories of them being almost alien esque. Yes, like not having ears or having very expressionless faces, and they're very quirky. Or you can't like even they see their face sometimes. Right. Right. And when they talk to you, they don't, they don't, um, like they'll ask a question. It's almost like I think of Ariel in uh, the little mermaid when she's talking, you know, the fork, she's combing her hair with mm-hmm. the fork. They don't know what the right terminology or the right use of things are. So they're very kind of quirky. So people have, have said that maybe the men in black are actually a race of aliens that are trying to keep it secret. And that's where the space brothers comes in because they're here to help us and mm-hmm. protect us. So they're trying to dispel the information right. so that we don't get more information out there. And, uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it kind of, kind of gets weird. I know when John Lear gets involved is when it gets way weird Yeah, to yeah. me, because that's where you start getting into, uh, I'm actually, my mind. I'm gonna look up the name of that base real quick. Okay, you look up my the mind. Base. My 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 mind is so. Uh, um, and I can't believe we we had that in the notes in the area 51 that we did. Uh, come on, Allison, you should know it. Yeah, no, I don't. Know. Dulce. Which Dulce. one? Dulce. 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 There. Yes. So anyway, my I don't know why my mind. I that's one of my, one of my some of my favorite tales, but I don't know why my mind went blank on that. Um, so yeah, John Lear was a, a pilot. He flew aircraft for a CIA company, uh, a CIA linked company. And that's where he gets involved that a secret government controls the world. And that runs like the international drug trade. It unleashed AIDS and other deadly diseases mm-hmm. to try to control population. Right. 
And let's see, the ultimate goal was to turn the earth and surrounding planets into slave labor camps. And um, John Lear is, uh, well, I think, one of the ones that talked about Dulce Base too. If I'm mistaken, I may be wrong. Yeah, he on was that. because he was he was a uh, part of the CIA as well, or and flew an aircraft for that was linked to the CIA. Right, and that's where he goes on and he says aliens on his grays because of their gray skin color mm-hmm. do more than abduct human beings. They mutilate and eat them, as well as using body parts to rejuvenate themselves. This, um, the secret government and the aliens labor. In, in underground bases in New Mexico, which is Dulce Base. Right. And uh, and then where they collect animals, human and animal organs, which is where the whole... The cow uh, mutilations. Animal, you know, cat, cattle mutilation. And then they drop them into a into this chemical soup and then manufacture these hybrid creatures, a- aliens, like human-alien hybrids. Which and is probably then, where the whole crypto thing comes into play, too. It could, yes. So that's where, to me, this is where it it starts getting crazy, just nutty at times. And maybe, maybe, you know, I really hope that I think that it's crazy and that's all there is to it. Because if it really does get out there, but then, you know, one thing just hit me: what if these solely soulless creatures that they're creating, <laughs> Bigfoot? We'll see. Then you have Ooh. the whole Bigfoot groups that talk about the alien Bigfoot connection. So, because that's what you know, there's a lot of theories that aliens have created Bigfoot as slaves to uh-huh. mine, you know, things from Earth, right. and that's why there's and that's why these things can transport or be in one place and not in the other. So it gets really weird. But so, and that's where they say the Men in Black gets involved in that is it's actually part of all of that secret government conspiracy right in order to keep that out of the public's eyes because if the public found out that the government was working with aliens in order to harvest humans then things would go just off the deep end so that's where they say the men in black kind of um where, where that kind of comes yeah but where john lear gets involved that to me that's when it really gets um it got really i mean <sighs> The 90s is where I think it <laughs> completely just went off the deep end. Right. Um, the, but then uh, what came out in the 90s? I don't know. When, when was the first Men in Black? I'm just kind of coming off this. Oh. Is that what? Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> I think it was 97. I think you might be right. But, yep, 97 sure was. So... So yeah, you know that's when it, when when it um, when they it said, kind of. Well, they even said that we would have uh, World War Three in 1999. Right. Yeah, the end of the millennia. And that's when they thought the whole Gulf War was going to be the end, and they even was talking about uh, oh, what's it, Notre Dame, the blue turban yeah, no, guy. Yeah. And then, and, the, yeah, his prophecies. Yeah, and then the second coming of Christ in 2011. That didn't happen. Uh, oh yeah, the, the Mayan calendar. Yeah, the Mayan calendar, and then uh, apparently George Bush was going to be the world's drug traffic <laughs> overseer. <laughs> well, and he had the CIA connection, so yeah. And let's not forget about the the base that we've had on Mars since the 60s. And the backside of the moon. Oh, yeah, the backside of the moon. That one, too. And that was part of the thing with John Lear was there was another, and I don't know if it was, I can't remember if it was John Lear, uh, the name of the guy that said that he was like the Marine, like the space Marines that went, and he actually worked on the base on Mars, and then he had to shoot out with the with the aliens in Dulce Base. Mm-hmm. Um, Not sure on that one. But, but, yeah, so that's where, that's where the story really got into the men in black being this just seek super secret government agency um, that in there, it's all conspiracy based and right. they're here to kind of turn you down and, and um, you know, kind of dispel, make you look crazy right? or make you get so scared that you don't want to tell your story anymore. Mm-hmm. And that they, they always say that anytime there's, UFO sightings that 
the men in black's going to come around and tell you to be quiet. Hmm. Well, Allison? Do, <laughs> she's like that. That gets that gets way off the deep end for you, doesn't it? She's like, no, nah. <laughs> I was running. I just, <laughs> just got to say that I just I just love y'all because. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about men in black i'm thinking johnny cash <laughs> sorry there you go Heck yeah well do you want to run to a quick um break while we get geared up for this second half real quick i need to pull up my next pages heck yeah we can we can do a commercial i can do that when we come back i'll talk a little more about what the men in black look like how they act and behave and then we'll go into kind of our thoughts on what we all think it is Works for me, Allison. Works for me. All right. We're gone then. Commercial break. The MPI Podcast. Online 24-7 at militaryparanormal.com. We'll be right back. One small step for Eddie, one giant leap for paranormal investigators. Meet the EDI Plus, the most feature-packed ghost hunting multimeter with graphing all in one tough package. Eddie has become a solid tool for investigators all over the world in just a few years on mission. Now the EDI Plus launches even further with more features for precision measurement, alerts, and timeline charting of the data. The EDI Plus detects EMF, temperature, vibration, pressure, and humidity with immediate response lights and sound alerts. But it doesn't stop there. Eddie then logs this information for graphing together on a timeline for thorough analysis using a free application developed specifically for the EDI Plus. Eddie is a stellar advancement in precision measurement and ease for paranormal investigators. Launch your investigations into the next stage of discovery with the EDI Plus. Available now only at GhostStop.com. Welcome back. This is Military Freedom Investigations, and this is our podcast. Unfortunately, we're not live right now, as we'll be prepared and sent out. We had a little issues trying to pub push to the live feed. <laughs> it was a lot. <laughs> but we, 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 I think it's probably because everybody, I was, when I was telling you guys, when we were sitting here trying to push, I got four notifications of live videos that came up on Facebook while wow. we were sitting here. So I think it's just this what's going on. Everybody's stuck at home, and, and everybody's still kind of... Um, I think everybody's on the social media and, and the streaming platforms. But again, Sorry. we are not affiliated to any branch of the military, and you can always find us at www.militaryparanormal.com. On Facebook at Military Paranormal, Twitch, YouTube. Um, I lost it all. <laughs> Twitter, Instagram. See, there you go. Yeah. And it's all sitting right here in front of me. <laughs> Come on, Allison. You it's Saturday. <laughs> so when we left you guys right before the commercial break, we kind of gave you a little bit of the history on on Men in Black. Um, if you want from? to, yep, you know, and kind of all started, you know, back in 1947 with a couple of guys, and then went up. Albert Bender was probably the most, I guess, wide known episode of men in black uh that, that kind of came about and then kind of get into some of the weird and that's where we think a lot of the movie you know right stereotypes if you will came from so now what i kind of wanted to tell you is is a little bit about what some people that encountered men in black mm -hmm. ha have said and 
probably the most common. It, you know, of course, they're wearing the black suits, black hats. Uh, they drive black cars. They might be wearing sunglasses. Some descriptions say that they kind of have just kind of like black eyes, almost like black eyed kids, if you will. Are they, are their faces, faces really expressionless, um, kind of cold, deep eyes, if you will. Their skin is said to be real plastic or pale, or maybe even like a tan or greenish color. Mm -hmm. And they have said, they're said that they, they've talked very, most reports say that they talk very monotone, almost robotic or synthetic sounding. And that they're, they're very cold and, and expressionless when, when they're trying to talk to you. Most people have said that when, that's had a, like a, a men in black encounter where somebody's come knocking on their door. You know, they'll have like a UFO sighting. They turn in their report. And then the next day, somebody shows up at their door knocking on their door. A couple of one of the things I want to say is if you really, really want to learn about men in black, you can go um, check out Nick Redfern's books. He's written it. I don't know. I know at least three, but again, I can't financially keep up with Nick's books because he puts them out so fast. So the, um, but there's some several good descriptions in there, but w- some of the stories, you know, say that they will be, they'll go, they'll be outside in the front yard and then come in the house and don't make it 10 steps in. And when they open the door, the black cars in the driveway and the guys are standing at the door and they're like, how did that, how did that just happen? It's only been, a second, you know, and then when they go to leave, they will, they'll they'll just be gone. Like they'll shut the door behind them and then instantly step over to a window and peek out of the window to see if they're leaving and they're gone. They're, They're not like still driving off. I mean, you're talking a second and then they're, they're gone. But most people think that they have some sort of almost ominous feeling as soon as they appear, they have like this ominous dread feeling and they'll have that for a couple of days after, after that they've had a visit by the men in black. Um, I'm, I do have a, an account here, um, that I, we found, I found on Reddit and he said, uh, th- this guy was talking about how he, he had gone out to Joshua tree national park with a few friends. They were looking up the stars and they witnessed a couple of glowing blue UFOs uh, going at really fast speeds. And they couldn't believe what was going on. They tried to take a photo, but they just moved too fast. On the drive back home, they talked you know, about what they had witnessed. And then they noticed a black car following them from a distance. And then they kept switching lanes, trying to lose it. And the, wherever they went, the car followed. And then as they glanced in the... Uh, in the rearview mirror again, they looked up and then looked back in the rearview mirror. And the car was gone. The next day, they ran a few errands and went when they went home. And then when they went back to their house, there was a black Cadillac parked in the driveway. He said he tried to convince himself that it wasn't the same black car following him, but he his, just his gut told him otherwise. When he got out of the car, two men in black and matching black suits, light gray dress uh, shirts, black ties and black fedoras approached and asked if they could ask me a few questions about what I witnessed the night before. I asked them who they were and asked to see some credentials. They claimed that they worked for a division of the U S air force. Their appearance uh, looked at only what they can describe as plastic and expressionless. And they both had a pale olive skin tone. They spoke in a raspy monotone voice and their speech was very precise, almost sounding synthetic. They also had very cold and intense glaze. Some of the questions they asked were, can you describe what you saw last night? What do you think you saw? Did you take any photos of what you witnessed? Were there others who might have had a recording device or camera? Do you know if anyone recorded the incident? Have you spoken about the incident with anybody else? And did you find unusual debris at the location you were at? And would you be withholding any important information from us? And he says, of course, he didn't answer most of the questions honestly. And he did withhold a lot of information as to what he saw and who he was with. Mm -hmm. They ended their questioning by strongly advising him from to, to refrain from talking about what he witnessed with anyone and to forget the incident ever happened. They also strongly implied that they would be keeping an eye on me in case I de- decided to ignore their demands. After the encounter, I had this constant ominous feeling for a while and always looked over my shoulder wherever I went. Um, that's basically a typical men in black sighting. That's almost to the T of how men in black sightings go. I mean, 
there, of course, there's several variations and things like that. Some of the things is uncomfortable around like a microwave oven or they're uncomfortable mm-hmm. around, you know, they'll keep looking at their watch and um, just certain things kind of set them off. And they almost have some witness accounts that I've read talk about how they almost like a, a you know, black eyed kids right? where when they're asking you questions, you're almost just kind of going along with what they're saying, almost like you're being mind controlled, if you will. But for the most part, most of those sightings are that that was a to the T sighting of, of a, a men in black encounter. Uh, I, it, if you look out there, there, there's there's a tremendous amount of, the, uh, of those of those sightings. I, I Allison was talking about it when we signed up. She kind of wants to go out and start saying she saw something so she can try to have an experience. But, you know, it's funny because I've read several authors that talked about how they didn't believe it. They were only doing research and writing on it. Right. And then the next day, you know, they'll be they'll, a couple of days later, they'll be somewhere and they'll have almost, they don't know if it was rather like a, their mind playing tricks on them, but they'll see like a black SUV parked out with people watching them and, and that sort of stuff. So it's a, um, it, it's, it's a little, uh, it's a little interesting. So yeah. on on that, I wanted to see if we could kind of lead into what you guys actually think are well, is. Before we do that, I may have a way to play the audio of that Men in Black encounter that I was talking about. So I'm trying it. Hopefully you guys can hear it. So I'm going to try. If it doesn't work, then we'll what you wanted to do, Mike. Okay. So let's Alrighty. see if this works sure this is not up loud I'm doing a line in so it should work so let's go ahead and do you can hear me now right oh. yes okay you may not be able to hear me because I'm gonna switch into the other side okay It was when I was at work. Man. All right, go for it. So I was closing Starbucks, right? So we got to start that. So it's, I'm going to just tell you the location. Right? Go for it. So Southwest Waterfront, Safeway. It's a Starbucks right inside the Safeway. It was one night I was closing, and I was there, like, extra late. So I got off, like, around 11 when I was supposed to get off at 30. And these two dudes, they, like, they was tall, and they, like, they was weird. Like, they, they didn't look normal. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. They was in suits, all black. And, like, I tried to look up at them. But you ever get that fear where you don't want to? Mm-hmm. So that's what happened. But I looked up and I couldn't make out their face. And I went outside to wait for my Uber. So I kind of looked in the store and they went in. And then, like, I had a call from my friend who was at the sub checkout. And she was like, I've never been, like, so scared in my life. Two dudes. And it clicked. I'm like, okay, maybe she's talking about the dudes. I'm just saying. But I didn't, you know, so I didn't know what was going on. Where was the location again? Southwest Waterfront. Same way. So that's no, 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 I mean town. Oh, Washington, D.C.? Okay. In D.C.? Mm-hmm. Ah, okay. So, she called me. She was like, oh, I'm so scared. I just had a third of my right. And how long ago was this? This was, this was 2018. 2018. This was, like, a, I want to say like a good six, seven months. Was there any reports of UFO sightings? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Because I know there are always sightings of something going over the White House lights or seeing mysterious. Uh, I wasn't sure if it was around that time frame. I don't know. Okay. But I'll look it up. Mm-hmm. She said she had to get off the phone because the plan manager was like tripping over it. She did. And I went back in the store. Like, so... You have the front entrance by station. Like, there's a train station. Mm-hmm. Like, that was one front station. You got the other side entrance. Right? Keep in mind, it was literally, like, two minutes that passed by. And the front end is all the way where the other entrance is. So, I walked down there. Like, asked what was going on. She said, like, they walked towards the back of the store. I was like, all right, cool. So, I went right out the exit. The exit, like, by the... By the, uh, what you call it, the checkouts, which mm-hmm. is like the front end, where the front end manager is. That door is like a 10 second walk 
get outside. And I got the thing on my Uber. So as I was going outside, I see them go out the front exit. I'm just like, they were in the back of the store. How did they get to the front exit so quick? You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And they walk towards, cause like, it's a long story. So this is me. This is them walking out as I'm about to go like towards my Uber. It didn't make sense how fast they got there. So I was like, yo, man. They run out, I was making jokes like, they run it. Mm-hmm. And then like, I left it alone, but it just stuck with me. Cause it's like, bro, I ain't never seen nothing like that. Did you see him get into a vehicle or anything? Or? Mm-hmm. I got him out of Uber and I was like, whatever, got on my phone. But it's so creepy to me because like the way they're built, they're like, they're like, block. they're not like buff, mm-hmm. but they're blocky. Like, it's funny. How tall? How tall? Yo, they had some height on them. They weren't identical, but they, they were tall. I'd say definitely 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, Maybe taller, but mm-hmm. definitely 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, no, no, no. And like I said, they were like blocky. Okay. Like, it's weird though, cause like they did not look. You ever seen like a dude with like real broad shoulders, but he's slim, mm-hmm. so he don't have traps? Yeah. That's how they work. Both of them. And it didn't make sense to me. That's all like, They didn't purchase anything, they just walked in and. They walked in, then they went like towards the front, and then they went straight back. <laughs> so we have out, so you got beer and wine, have like frozen stuff right here, and then you got like canned goods, the little cereals that this and the third. And on the far side, you got the doors to where they cut the fruit and where we break down boxes and like our dock. Then there's another door for dairy because the dairy section is right here. Then you have at the front where the front doors are that is where they cut fruit, it leads into the back, and then you have another back door where the meat department is. So, to get from this side, where dairy is, to frozen, it's not like a long walk, but you know, it's a it's a nice enough walk, whereas you're not getting to the front. You all the way in the back, regardless if you buy beer and wine, which is closer to the mm-hmm. front section, to get to the front door of the station, you're not getting there, though. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, that don't make sense. So, huh? So I was just a few, and I'm like, oh, that's crazy. They came in crazy. I'm not really scared of anything, but I was like... Yo, and there's that? multiple witnesses, that, especially yeah. that friend of yours. Yeah, hmm. everybody seen it. Everybody was like, y'all seen it. But you never saw the face. It was like, like, was it the... Like, it was just dark down there, and every time you wanted to see yeah, it, they like... Yeah, that's, hey, that's, that's another Did thing. they have on glasses? Or you couldn't tell? I don't know. Okay. But, what, what type of hat? Hey, that's not like, not like one of them, like, older hats, but the door type hat. Door? Okay. Hey, but what's funny is they never took them off. Hmm. Uh, like, yeah. usually people take off their hats when they yeah. come doors, just like us, we have to. Right. They can take theirs off. Hmm. So, Interesting. That's the creepy thing. But I'm You mind if I do it on the podcast? Of course. Ooh. But the yes. weird thing about it is, like, we, we were talking about that, like, like two days at work. It was like, hmm. And then we, like, I told my manager, and my manager, she, I don't know much about that. So, I'm not that's interesting. It's creepy. Yeah, but that's good. That's good, because I'm going to definitely play that story. Oh, but it's, it's funny, though, because, like, I, um, I started looking into it. And not, like, at our location, but, like, I had seen, like, stories about it like, on YouTube. Uh-huh. Two dudes like went into like this hotel and they got they got caught on camera. But of course you couldn't make out their face. Uh-huh. The quality was bad. Right. Um and like the person who was on front end did like see their faces, even though they didn't even have anything obscuring uh-huh. their faces. So. Right. That's weird. But that's my story. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll definitely put that on the vlog. I can hear you, but you need to go up. Oh, there you go.
You still there, Allison? Yes. There we go. There you go. All right. Okay, so I, I have I have two questions. Go for it. Okay. What kind of store was this? A uh, grocery store. Okay. And I thought he the... said a Starbucks in the beginning. That's oh, awesome. He, he worked at Starbucks in the grocery store. Gotcha. Okay. Oh, okay. So kind of like a Target. Target has. Yeah, those. exactly. Kind of, I, I would assume so. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the second question is: Did you happen to look up to see if there was any sightings? No, I did not get to that part because I totally forgot because I was trying to work everything else out. But <laughs> 2018, I'm, I'm, like I said, there's always some sort of sighting around Washington D.C. So, well, and the thing you have to you have to look at too is it, it wouldn't have to be him. Maybe they weren't there necessarily for him or his friend. Maybe they were there for somebody that had a sighting. And they just happened to witness them. Now he's talking about the two guys in the hotel. Right. I'm going to put a picture. I'm going to forward this to you, Rob. Okay. To put up. I have a copy of that picture. This is one of the classic examples that goes across the interwebs here um, of the men in black, what, what they look like. And apparently there was another story behind this. I need to, I should have had that ready, but um, there is a, there's quite a few pictures out there like this where they catch them, but you can't make out. Well, you know what they love, but it is right. what it is. Two guys, black suits, black shoes, black fedoras. Right. You know, and, and there was, um, you know, there's this mystery behind what they're doing. So, yeah, it wouldn't necessarily have to be maybe even that they had a sighting there. Maybe somebody had a sighting somewhere else and they came back and now they were there. Or maybe they were there to intimidate somebody that just had information. Right. You know what I mean? If that's even what it was. But what I like about it is, you know, when we talk about what we do is a as investigators, whenever we, when you listen to his story, this guy, you know, he, he can explain, he can remember what the grocery store, you know, what was between beer and wine and exactly. dairy and meat, you know, so he's remembering this stuff almost like he's picturing it in his head. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, you know, a lot of people say, well, he's so detailed that he's fabricating it. But if I, when I listen to his story, I'm hearing him recall this in his head. This is what, you know, and, and I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking there and there's no way they could have gone to the front of the store and, you know, then they were there. And you, you know, should have seen just, it when he was explaining, he was like, you got it over here and then it's over here. And he was saying it's a long distance. And he's like, there's yeah. no way they could do that. And so, I mean, you, I could almost hear that. And again, I didn't interview him in person, but you could kind of hear that inflection mm -hmm. where he's, you know, right. where he's almost thinking about how did this, how did this happen? But again, that's the typical, one of the typical signs is they're, here and then you look away and look back and they're gone, gone right know, or they've moved all of a sudden they're there you know it's like it happens instantaneously mm -hmm. like they move so, really really quick yes all righty all right, so um i was there, that was just a way to figure it out i figured out how i could get it in there on my h5 and put it through the other line in but yeah you wouldn't be able to hear me but i thought it was a pretty good story i really did yeah, that's pretty interesting. So on, on that, mm -hmm. what do you? Um, I'll let Allison I I go with this one first. I, I, yeah, I know Allison. <laughs> I know that you're very new to the whole u ufology thing, and I know you've been really researching a lot, trying to get up to speed on it. But what do you, what are your thoughts on the Men in Black? Just you know, especially somebody that's new, and you're just now hearing this, you know. I think I'm going to start paying a little bit more attention around me to see if I can't find the men in black. Oh, you're going to go hunt for them, huh? Yes. Nice. Yes. Um, do I think they exist? I think there's men and women out there that when you start talking about stuff that the government doesn't want you to know, I believe there's people out there that will come and try to intimidate you. I, I, I'm, I'm going to steal your for a second there. That was a great segue. When I was talking about Nick's book earlier, The Men in Black, he also has a book called Women in Black, which goes over the exact thing which you were just saying there, men and women. So I shouldn't be so so um, close minded there on that. But well, no, I think I think with the with the dates, I don't I don't remember the year that you said that this all started, but. Men, that was, 47. I'm going to get in trouble here, but 
that's what men did. They took care of stuff like that. Right. Mm -hmm. And kind of sheltered the women from that. And then now in today's society, I'm sure there's more women in it. I'm sure but I still, I'm, I'm still that skeptic that I want to see in order to believe. I can, yeah, I can yeah, see that. I can see it. So do you think the men in black are a real thing or a psychological thing? Something to just create mass panic. Ooh. Can I go with all the above? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Uh, yeah, exactly. I do too. I think that you have the potential to have people that do have psychological issues that have alien reports and this sort of thing that now are schizophrenic and may have a delusional thing that somebody's watching them. So the first person they see in a black suit, now they're the men in black. Mm -hmm. And then I think that you have the real possibility of having a clandestine government agency, you know, that's has secret agents. What was your other, you had, you said three things, uh, real, which you said psychological drama or just doing it for, to create mass panic. So maybe like a counter counter intelligence, right? Kind of discredit, create panic, mm -hmm. discredit, right? Because that's one of the big topics on the UFO stuff is exactly. Maybe some of that stuff is People put are out crazy. Too. So, like for the longest time, uh, ooh, what was oh, going to kill me now? The guy that we were going to see this year at the Bigfoot conference. Oh, you, Travis Walton. Yeah, Travis Walton. There you go. Yeah. At first, they took him serious. Then they started saying, that, no, you're a crackpot and all this. And so I, I was really looking forward to hearing his story. Hopefully he comes back next year. I really yeah, that hope That was so. my highlight of the year that, was, that I was Yes, thinking. same. When we sit here at the beginning of 2020 saying, I really hope 2020 is better. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> We shouldn't. Have, we jinxed ourselves. Yeah, we did it's completely. I mean, we've even jinxed ourselves on this dang podcast that we keep saying that we're going live, and all of a sudden, whoop, there it goes. Well, <laughs> re-recorded seems to be working. So you think all of, all of the above? Well, me when I was going through now. Okay, let me back up. In the beginning, yes, I was there wholeheartedly thought that there possibly could be a some sort of government agency um, that went out there to discourage people from talking about their UFO encounters. That way it wouldn't create mass panic, such as Orson Welles did with his story. So, mm -hmm. yes, I would think that there would be something to that. When I started doing the research on the doll story and the Christmas story, and it led me to the FBI files, and I was reading all in detail how they went about interviewing him, the pressure they put on them about saying, well, if you want to continue your story, we're going to charge you with the deaths of these officers and it's going to completely destroy your family. So I think that's where it ties in as well. So starting off with the men in black, me personally, I think it had to do with the FBI because back then, 1940s, late 40s, the dress code back there was the fedora hat, black tie, whole nine yards, everything was black. So that's where I think the men in black started from was the FBI investigating all these different encounters, not to mention the Air Force when they started up Project Blue Book. Now, granted, there was Air Force personnel, but we weren't wearing the typical blues that we are now. So if you look at, say, the OSI agents that we have now, they wear suits. So even before it was just regular Air Force doing the Project Blue Book, we had civilian individuals as well. What was the dress attire back then for when we started that? It was black dress, dark, suit-like, had to be professional. So I think that's where the whole men in black, black suit came from. But like I said, I still think that there could be some clandestine secret government to say, hey, we're going to discourage you from doing that. Do I think they're aliens? Oh, my own personal life, I don't think they're aliens. Uh, psychological drama, once again, I think they're trying to, well, 
if someone was going off the deep end, could there be drugs involved to try and quiet them? Possibly. And then once again, like you said, with the mass panic, I would say they're trying to get away from the mass panic. But could there possibly be? Yes, there could possibly be. But I think it started from the original investigations. Okay, so, so with today's technology mm -hmm. and everybody able to look at all this information, do you actually think that they would stay dressed that way? Or do you think that they would kind of want to blend in more so that somebody like me isn't, you know, grabbing their phone and any man slash woman I see coming towards me, I'm going to videotape them thinking that they are the men in black. I think that, see, some of the stories that I read that talk about, they're almost, they're so quirky. And some Which of when you look at some, said. they were kind of blocky. Yeah really weird and when you when you think about how they talk about they they use the wrong terminology and phrases and i can't remember what one phrase was but you know it's it's um so it's like the f they're trying to almost say what they what they think you they want you to what you want to, to hear does that make sense okay so if somebody if they're trying to come up with that making like an appealing image of themselves they're trying to come across with authority maybe they would want to have that black suit still so that you have that intimidation factor so are you but trying, i also are you trying to think kind of like a off the deep end a uh, jedi mind trick these are not the droids you're looking for kind of thing yeah i mean yeah i mean you know if if you're going to intimidate somebody and tell them that hey you're not going to talk about this anymore because we can cause a lot of trouble for you. And these now you already have the image of them. I think in the beginning, maybe you're right. The FBI was out there investigating. They were wearing the typical gear. Then it became this story. In the 80s, it blew up. Mm -hmm. And now you have this stuff going on. And if somebody really saw, and I'm going to tell you what my theory is on some of this in just a second. But So now you have somebody that sees something they're not supposed to see. And you show up on the door and... What what would you you would want to when you think about where you where you shake no, your hand for? No no no, uh, come on, we're in Texas. <laughs> so so you, uh, you can have a six six two guy standing there, two hundred pound, all decked out with a gun. That's going to intimidate somebody. So why why would you have to have a suit? Okay, the so way I'm going is so oh, you sorry. see something that you see something odd. So you already have this mental deal going on in your head the next day somebody shows up in a black car a black suv tinted windows tinted all out they get out they're acting really quirky kind of like just way off their rocker and now they're like hey and they're asking you these questions because everybody knows what a ufo is everybody knows kind of i think i don't think there's anybody out there that doesn't know some <laughs> backstory of uh, of a ufo sighting so then they show up and they say hey what did you see did anybody else see it can i have your camera what's well, on your camera roll oh and you're not going to talk about this because we can make your life miserable we can make your life a living hell and then again all that quirkiness all that sort of stuff going on it makes you uncomfortable you know what i mean and and i so if you and, and this is gonna i hope this doesn't come across <laughs> but you have <laughs> you ever met something <laughs> have you ever met somebody that is really off their rocker and you're talking to them and you are uncomfortable you know what i mean not when i say uh -huh. off their rocker i mean maybe even to the point of you know they're kind of crazy but when they're talking and your thing is, is almost, you almost psychologically, you go into almost a fight or flight. You, I need to get out of this situation. Mm -hmm. So you have somebody that's acting kind of just so odd that it puts you off of your game. And now they're also dressed to the part. They're acting the part. They're all of this sort of stuff. And they're telling you, you're not going to talk about this. And then, so now your brain is like, holy cow. And then you go research this. You see all these stories about men in black and it fits the puzzle, and now you're like, well, dang, maybe I ain't going to say anything about this. Maybe I need to keep my mouth shut, because this is, what if they were aliens? Holy cow, right, because, yeah. man, they were really weird. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. But I see what you're saying. I mean, but it is also Texas. If I see somebody pull up in a suit with a gun on and come up talking, my first thought is it going to be is it the Rangers investigating something? You know what I mean? I, you know, it's Texas. I mean, we, we we've got you, you see that you know. I stood in line next to a mom with five kids the day in the grocery store that was strapped with a 45. You know what I mean? It's that doesn't intimidate me. If somebody came up really acting off their rock or acting weird, their skin was all pasty, wearing sunglasses, acting nutty and telling me I'm not going to talk about something. That's going to put me <laughs> off guard. You know what I mean? That's, uh, okay. That's, okay. Well, let, let me go this way. You already have it in your mind that you saw something that you know, isn't right. Mm-hmm. So you're already in that right state. So anything that happens, you're you're just going to be on the edge, right? Because you truly don't want to, or you don't know if you can go to your friends or family and say, "This is what I saw," because they will commit you because they're going to think right. that you've gone off the deep end, right? So I think if anybody approaches me, if I saw something. I don't, I just, I don't know how I would react. And see, and I think that's what the, I think that's the technique. That's, I think it's a psychological warfare almost, if you will. I think that's what the whole process is. But I also agree that when you look at sightings, there are still some odd sightings out there, but it was really a big blow up in the eighties and nineties. So it, either did it die down because it kind of left the topic of discussion or are you correct Allison in that they have decided hey maybe we need to dress the part and you know and go in street clothes you know and be something different but I think it would be an authoritative thing and that's why it would be that way so my, my thought is is I agree with Rob I think in the beginning days it probably was FBI I think that it was FBI CIA something that had to do with national security yeah and there's two ways to look at it. For one, it was either, which is still what goes on nowadays. When you look at like ATIP or any of those programs where it may be our technology, it may be foreign technology, it may be alien technology. But it, as a matter of national security, nobody wants you to talk about that. Who's, whosever technology it is, whether it's ours, an enemy or an alien if you see something legitimate as a matter of national security, for one, like Rob said, if it really was alien, there's mass panic hysteria. I mean, and, and I know that the memes went around like crazy, but look at what happened with the toilet paper. If oh, we had Lord. a real Independence Day scenario, and that's the first dumb. thing you grab, that's and, and, why they won't tell you that there's aliens because what, people will react that way. And, and sometimes, I, and the and only I, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna get weird awesome. on you. Glad you said that. <laughs> I'm gonna get I'm I'm gonna say my one weird spiel because I think that this is all what it is as far as the coronavirus. I don't think there's anything different. But if there were any conspiracy that I would believe on it, when you look back at 2017, all the ATIP stuff came out. Mm -hmm. All of this stuff started happening. All of the you know China went to the backside of the moon. All of these things started coming out. There's more and more stories that hey. Just here, right at the end of the year, the Navy released more videos yep. of, you know, Captain Fravor and the things that were going on there. So what if this was about to blow up and it got out out of control with with Lou Elizondo and all of those sorts of things? And now it was fisting to get released. And we know that mass hysteria would ensue. So that would be the only conspiracy that I'm hearing in any of this that would apply to coronavirus. Maybe this was a way... To, to test to test that what so you oh I, you, and i'm not saying like, that's what it was that no, would be the I, only conspiracy that i would that i would believe I on like this that. right now. I, I like how you turn that where you're thinking that the coronavirus is a test to tell us that yes there are aliens out there to see if there's a mass panic and so coronavirus to see also, how we would behave see how we would behave because like and i brought obviously, up the point we couldn't take it as a, as a society, as a world society, we no, couldn't take it. No, and that's like, I, I, I'm going back to the Men in Black movie. First one. When Tommy Lee Jones tells Will Smith for the first time, and he has to decide. And he's like, well, why don't you just tell people? He's like, people are smart. Yes, a person is smart. 
But people are dumb, panicky animals. Mm -hmm. Look what happened. Toilet paper. And I, I want to clarify that. Again, I'm not saying that's what it is, no, but that no. would be a conspiracy that I could bite off on. That's, because that's a nice one of the conspiracies like that, that I'm hearing that, that I could bite off on. And, you know, and so nowadays I think that I don't know where I think about the men in black. I think that it was probably I think that there is a legitimate agency probably that has to do with the roots of the, the men in black. FBI ACA, just like that from the forties, fifties, mm -hmm. as those stories were coming out. It was more of information gathering. What did you see? Because I think this stuff happened back then that we really don't know what <gasps> really what happened. Why do we create so, Space Force? Okay. Oh. All this ties in. Oh. Look at the timeline. There's conspiracy <laughs> theories that you can get off on if you really get deep. Again, I'm weird. I know. but May 1st. So, May 1st. They're now accepting applications to Space Force. Just saying. I wish I, wish I weren't so old. I wish this would have happened I, when I was still in. I would have jumped up, um, but RAF is, I, I looked it up because I was, I was curious. RAFSCs wouldn't account. You had to have, everyone that's in Space Command now automatically goes over. A few AFSCs go over as well would be the uh, computer side bet, and all that. I bet my AFSC would have. <laughs> well, yeah. And so you got to put an application in. Maybe I can be a civilian. Oh, so anyway. Oh, oh, so maybe I can too. Oh, never mind. <laughs> So I was like, you guys. Now, are dumb. I don't. I don't know what y'all are talking about. The so, Space Force, our new military you know branch. We created a fifth, uh, actually a sixth, sixth branch. One. If you, want. you know how so okay. the Air Army, Force, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, and now, and now there is a legitimate Space Force. Yep. Okay. Hey, I'm just learning everything tonight. <laughs> so, it um, it's been talked about for years. President Trump did sign the the order making it happen but it's been going on behind the scenes for a while and when um, did he sign the order but it, that all that happened in line with all this today that's what i'm saying, that's what I'm saying. it 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 really gets it really gets deep but so nowadays i think that when you look at all the a tip stuff and all of that stuff sort of kind of stuff coming out i really think that it's even more possible that there is a real Man in black, mm -hmm. men, men and women in black. I really think that there is some agency behind that, whether it be a civilian security force for some contractor company, whether it be the CIA, the FBI, some other secret black program. I believe that there, the possibility of having those agents would be there. So then when you look at the technology, if mm -hmm. the theories hold true of I don't think I don't think Roswell was. I, I'm leaning more towards Roswell was probably something there, more down to earth. Yeah, something not not, not necessarily what like something down to earth. That, but oh, I, I forget what that at, secret mission was. And I, I knew it. Oh, I'm gonna look it up. <laughs> whenever you um but if let's say there was a race that came and that's where why well, our technology blew up, why we got exponential growth on cell phones and computer chips and all of these sorts of things that were happening. I think it's possible if you did have someone that was a, a separate race of beings that they, they could be involved. But in my, my, my whole opinion is I believe that they are probably a U.S. secret government program, an agent that's trying to find out just what people know. And I do believe that they're probably... You know, I knew somebody that used to work in counterintelligence, which is deception and those sorts of things. That that's that's real. I mean, that's when you talk about spy spy stuff and James oh, Bond that, stuff. The, that's yes. This information is a serious program. In order, again, if if you put so much misinformation out there, nobody knows what the truth is. Right. So if you had somebody out there that says, "Hey, it's trying to intimidate." Yeah, all day long. So, yes, I do believe it's probably some government agency of our own. Project Mogul. That, so, because for that one, well. there, if, <laughs> or even, so there's either there's two possibilities. It is our technology that somebody witnessed, so they want them to shut up. Or two, there's aliens, and there's a UFO, a, aircraft, a, a extraterrestrial aircraft, spaceship, whatever you want to call it, and we don't know. We don't want people to mass panic. There, there's two, or we want people to know that we know that they're here. Right. Because I mean, then you can get into stories of 
the black aircraft following the UFOs. Yeah. And I mean, you could go down a rabbit hole so deep. Oh, definitely. You, yes. We, we can't cover that here. I mean, it just, it goes on and on and on and on and on. So, well, um, the podcast will go on and on and on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can go on and on and on. Y'all know that. So anyways, well, I wish that this show, we would have gotten off. Uh, I know. I think it we got been so great. flustered because this second half has been, again, awesome, I think. I love and, it. Oh. And I, I wish that the beginning of the show would have taken off as good, but I think we were so flustered with trying to get things running yeah. again. So um, hopefully you stuck around to this. and Maybe you we have just listened. start with the commercial in the beginning, you know. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, which the first half wasn't bad. It was just us trying to get into our groove here. And this is all still new to us. I mean, it's only our third show that we've done from separate geographical exactly, location. Yeah. Still trying technology, and everything's kind of going crazy But I there, can so. tell you that the pictures are – I fixed the pictures that were jumping back and forth. That I fixed. Oh, good deal. So, so Allison, you have anything else you want to add? Is that – I mean, I had, I enjoyed your input tonight. Yes. <laughs> Say I'm learning. That's what happens when you get educated. And I think uh, I, no, I, I don't think I have anything else. I, I think what I'd like you to do, Mike, is kind of tell people again where they can go to get just a little bit more information. I can't remember the guy's name that you said. Who I absolutely enjoy is Nick Redfern, and I believe he has. Let me see if I can. If y'all will help me here, I'm gonna. I think he has a. Let me see if he's got a website. I think he does. I know on his Facebook you can get stuff. I think it's his Facebook. Um, oh, but he has. Uh, um, I see him on Instagram, liking. You can get his books on Amazon all day long. Oh yeah. Um, but he has. Let me get back to this site here. There are. I think it's this one. Oh. I got no. That wouldn't. They wouldn't give me his phone number, email, and address on that one. <laughs> He's got a YouTube channel. Um, I know that he has the, the real Men in Black. Yep. He has the Men in Black personal stories and eerie adventures. Um, and then there's Women in Black that he just wrote, which is um. And then I have. I'm pretty sure I had another Men in Black one that I got in 2018 when we went to. Anyway, he's got. Nick has so many books, and if you ever want to get in depth on any of that stuff, I mean, the the, the guy is just wonderful at at um at getting that out there. There's some videos where he's done interviews. You can you can search for. I'd love to have Nick on the on the show sometime oh. because it's just a yeah. wealth of knowledge. Um, if you ever talk to him in person, he's the same way. Whenever you get to talking to him, you yeah, it's, you open up stuff, that yeah. yeah, and you open up that can of of uh, uh, open up that rabbit hole because you just start. He, he's just a wealth of knowledge, but he has some great books on the men in black. If you want to look at any of that and there might be other authors too. That's just who I'm familiar with. So you see him on ancient aliens and monsters and mysteries and all those shows as well too. So, right. All righty. Anybody else have any comments or opinions on men in black? I guarantee if we were live, we would have so many questions and comments. <laughs> I guarantee you we would. Oh, you know what we should well, hey, you should stream it live and we'll get on there that's and, what i'm thinking that's i was yeah. just thinking the same thing great minds here we go okay cool we're all we're all on the same page <laughs> yep. and all right so do you want to do uh tech corner and then we can talk about our uh, other adventures i uh if you want to do tech corner because i did not research any of that. <laughs> I told you about that one. That was the, the Zoom H3, the virtual yes. reality 360. Yes, that's pretty cool. That thing is amazing. Like, I'm using my H5 right now to to record the mic. That's how I did all the audio right now. But the when I saw the Zoom H3 on the new Ghost Hunter show, I was like, what is that? And then they used it for their audio playback doing the reveal of the footage. And because it's recording in virtual reality, you were able to pinpoint where that EVP was actually coming from. Um, it features four built-in mics arranged in an ambisonic array. Uh, the audio maker makes it easy easier than ever to capture full spec full spear surround sound recordings. Immerse audio is critical for virtual reality production, obviously, but if you want to use it for the paranormal world, 
imagine having that out there, listening to it in real time, and figuring out exactly if you caught something on audio, figuring out exactly where it was in the room. That- well, you know, when we, we and we've we've done I, I, this is what on my one of my next to do equipment buys because. You know, we've done several. I've done it. The one I um, I talked about in a video I did a while back that was we did an experiment where we kept hearing this clicking sound, but it wasn't a typical click pop that you get in a in a house settling. It was this it was a distinct sound and we couldn't figure out what it was. Well, I went back to the location and I I um I found out it's one of these paddle light switches in this really old building from like the early 1900s. It was a twist deal and it was the exact same sound. We did right. verify that on a, on an audio spectrum. We could actually see the yep. frequencies, everything from it. Well, but what I did is I set up multiple stereo recorders right, right. and I was able to pinpoint which one it was based off of where we were. Our initial one was set up yep. and all of that. This yes, would have been one file. One I mean, file, yes. You would have set this up and it would have captured surround sound in the room. You could have put it on an audio spectrum and been able to determine where it was coming from. The other thing I like about this thing is it has a six access, so motion sensor, which ensures a true to life surround feel. So no matter the position that you put it in, you put it up straight, sideways, upside down, tilted, it doesn't matter. It's still based on, it's still going to give you the full spectrum of where it is standing up and like it was standing straight. It, it, it's right. amazing what this thing can do. I, I well, want and I, one. <laughs> we, and we are not sponsored by Zoom or no, anything like that. No. We just enjoy their products. They're, it's yes. been, I, I, I carry an H1 with me everywhere. Zoom. Yeah, don't, yeah, hand, 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 Zoom. Uh, hint, hint. <laughs> um, I, I carry an H1 there. with me. I, I carry an H1 with me everywhere. Rob has an H5 um, that he takes and produces. And I mean, it's, it's every, it does everything. So this is what I want to add to my, inventory here pretty soon exactly to be able to know the 360 degree sound field of it being up down left right balancing not to mention just, you can also image it, it records on a you can have up to a 512 gigabyte disc so it records on that then you can use it with the uh, auto mic positioning detection to find out exactly where it's at and you can also put it on uh, use it with uh, adobe uh premiere not premiere um Audition. Audition. Yeah. Use it with that one, and you would be able to actually see, like, you were able to pinpoint. See the channels. Exactly. See, you can see the channels. Oh, yeah. It, I'm, I'm really stoked about that device. When I saw that and how they utilized it, I was. Uh, well, you know, I'm revising the, uh, what my thought is, is, you know, I'm revising my. Um, parabolic mic. Parabolic mic. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I wanted to do after our little episode where we got the thing that growled at us, <sighs> which I don't think was anything paranormal, but it no, scared it was the not, dude, of us. What do you mean scared us? <sighs> what are you talking about scared us? Our hands went straight to our guns. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, so one of the things that I wanted to do is what we what happened is we were recording but the sound that we ca- we were i was pointed in one direction and over to the side of us just a little bit we think it was probably a big cat yes. that growled, growled at, us. at us and but it because it wasn't in my field of view from my parabolic mic we didn't capture it very well but so what i want to do is i want to stick another microphone up there on top of it to capture full surround general Ooh. sound so this 360, if I put up, <gasps> would capture whether the sound was coming from wherever around us where we got it from. Yeah. So anyway, that's one of the things that I want to do here. Okay. Uh, but it's it's a little, I think it's a little pricey. I think it's around three hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> it is. It's um, up there. So, but still, all right. It'd, it'd probably be worth it. Oh yeah. I really like this tech corner that we've added. I think it's pretty pretty good little segment. Yeah, I like so. it. I like it. I like it a lot. All right. Oh, all right. So, if you've looked on the stream, and I mentioned it earlier, on front, you see that we have three sticker tags up there. We have the MPI Skype podcast. We have Mike's um, Undiscovered Origin Skype tag. And then we have another one, the Paranormal Road Rider Skype podcast tag. But, Mike, I would like for you to tell more about yours because now we're in the networking. So... Not to say that we're going away from MPI at all. 
what we're doing is creating new avenues to get more people in so that we can collaborate more between the three different ideas that we have. So Mike, tell us a little bit about yours. And it gives us a creative outlet to kind of run with our own weirdness every now and then. Exactly. So my, so one of the things, my actual slogan is where my, my goal is to educate and explore all realms of the paranormal with an emphasis on making the paranormal less obscure to bring it to more people, uh, changing the paranormal perspective. One of the things that we all talk about all the time is sometimes when we go out, even for the most, we've been in this a long time and, and I, and I don't get me wrong, what I'm about to say, cause I, I've, I'm always afraid to say this, but sometimes it gets too weird. It can at times. And everything seems to be, and don't get me wrong, I like it. Halloween is my favorite time of year. I like horror movies. I like those sorts of things. But us as the paranormal field is is a small little niche in society, mm -hmm. if you will. But I think that when you look at stats and there's like 75% of the U.S. population believe in something paranormal, but why aren't they more involved in it? I think it's because it gets... It doesn't always have to be dark. It doesn't always have to be gloomy. It doesn't always have to be in that. So one of the things that I wanted to do was take a sense of adventure, um, a little bit of my outdoorsy stuff, try to tie it in and try to capture a broader spectrum of people into the paranormal um, where it's a little more. That's why I didn't put the name paranormal in the group mm -hmm. or in the name, because I wanted to be able to kind of bring it. And I'm actually working on some revamp of some logos and things. But anyway, undiscoveredorigins.com or on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. I have about six, seven videos up now. Uh, seems to be taken off. I know Rob's going to say the same thing. Yeah. We begged you guys to subscribe to us here. Go subscribe to us there. We're planning on doing it. Which I have to thank all our listeners and viewers out there. We have finally reached over 100 subscribes on YouTube. Thank you people for that. I know I've been begging for it just about every episode, but we finally did it last I heard. Or last I saw, we were at 107. We, we may have nice. gotten some more. So, yeah, it went up real quick there. All of a sudden, we got like 10 over there. So I know Rob worked really hard. We put a video together mm -hmm. on my go bag, and then we've actually been working on some stuff. Right before all this happened, we started working on – we actually did one of um, – our members' houses. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that, but anyway, we filmed some stuff there. Uh, yeah, I think we were all right as long as we didn't show the location. So, right. ain't that right, Allison? <laughs> we can edit this out if you don't want to say it. But, um, but anyway, we we have the the inside that we filmed, and we actually wanted to bring some of that to you guys—a little little different perspective on things. So. Right. All right, Rob, you want to tell us a little more? Okay. On yours. Uh, me, I like to travel a lot. OK, but I don't get the opportunity to travel a lot. I know you and I and Jeff and Allison have been toying with this idea of going out to different locations and putting something together. I was out probably what was the last weekend? I think it was. I think it was just last weekend. Mm -hmm. I finally got to go on my motorcycle bike ride again. And so I got the wild spur up my butt and I was like, you know what? I'm getting on the bike and I'm going. I'm just I'm just going. Don't know where I'm going, but I'm going. Ended up heading back to some some road that I was like, oh, that looks good. And I turned on. And I came across an old gas station, uh, an old FINA gas station in a little, little itty-bitty town in here in Texas. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Didn't stop. Didn't take any pictures of it. Got to the end of the town and went to, a, to another town. And they had an old style, another gas station, but this one was actually functional, but it still was old style. It had the kind of like an old wooden uh, storefront and then a, two of the old style pumps. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. Well, I actually wanted to find out more about that one, took some pictures and everything. And then I went down the road and a historical marker was right there. So I went off the road read the historical marker, and I was like, you know what, this would be pretty cool if I tie in some history with my bike riding, not to mention if anything was paranormal, because you know about the different types of paranormal stuff or what attracts something, what attracts the paranormal to something. So I was riding and I was going through the valleys and I was like, you know what, what if I, and did something that MPI wanted us to do as far as the recon. So, 
I decided to take my bike out there and film me going to these locations doing nothing but strictly recon on the different historical sites if there's any pain paranormal there just a little something and learn the history of it and put that on kind of like a video blog too um, I call it the paranormal road rider because they have just about everything else out there now it's going to be more of a short video kind of like what Mike has been doing of reconning a certain area see if it has paranormal or if there's any suspected paranormal locations go out to these locations and see if I can't debunk or find the actual story behind that um, and that's basically where I was going with it I mean you can find me on paranormalroadrider.com I already found that one out there uh, you can find me on YouTube Paranormal Road Rider there. Same thing as Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just find me on Para Road Rider. Um, I should have an intro video coming up. I already have my Facebook site up there, and I put a new logo on there. I actually did four logos, trying to see which one is better. I know which one I really like. I kind of like did a little thing up there and already put it in there. But that's basically where I'm going. I'm not going away from MPI at all. Same thing with Mike. All I'm trying to do is just bring a different perspective out there because this whole COVID-19, we're still kind of like on our own. So this just gives me an outlet of me being able to do what I like to do, enjoy, and going on my motorcycle and just going where the road goes. I, I don't know where I'm going to end up. I come to a crossroad. Do I go left? Do I go right? Whatever. Okay, so that that's basically what I plan on doing with this channel. And like Mike, I hope that you like and subscribe to me because I'm going to be even newer than he is that's my spiel and I'm not trying to change anything but as Mike said he's trying to change the perspective of the paranormal and I kind of like coined his phrase shifting the perspective <laughs> so that's basically where I'm going with my little video vlog alrighty good deal <laughs> alright Allison, do you have anything you want to add in before we wrap up? I think I'm good. Well, I was glad I'm, that I'm, you I'm ready for the in. next. Yeah, yeah, I'm ready for the next topic. So, what do what, you want to view? I don't know. Um. Well, scenes. Ha Ooh, I know because you've actually talked about this when we were off the air. You said you're watching a new paranormal show. So why don't we do kind of like a. Um, what do we think of certain paranormal shows? Kind of like a review of paranormal shows. Oh, that'll be good. Aha, uh -huh, there we go. So that's our next one then. Alrighty. Y'all are going to have to run with this because I don't watch many <laughs> I don't watch much TV, to be honest with you. But well, Neither do I, but still, it's not, you know, you can still get on there and look at one. You I'm, know? I'm really disappointed I haven't got to see the new ghost hunters and and the, all the remakes that came from jason and grant and all those guys so i'm really i'm really wanting to get into that and i do like skinwalker ranch so see then you're Somewhat. watching one so that'll be yours <laughs> yeah that'll be yours all righty okay let's see what we got here uh da, 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 da. nope wrong one what the I have oh, there. Rob is trying. There we Rob's go. Trying now to, we're good. <laughs> while Rob's trying to find our uh, outro music, there, I'm, I just wanted to tell everybody that I, I got um, it now. I hope that uh, everybody is staying safe. It looks like things are. The curve is starting to go down. It looks like maybe we'll start to um, start to level out here. So hopefully, in the next couple, three, four weeks, we will be getting back to normal. And I uh, hope everybody is able to pull through this okay as far as not just sickness, but financially mm -hmm. and mentally, because I know that um, it's been taking a big toll on society mentally, too. So, well, it I, is a I, I don't know if you know, but our county um, in Wichita Falls, they kind of opened up the. Yeah, um, we made the national news. Yeah. Oh, did we? Yeah, because the governor said no. You know, <laughs> well, I don't think people got that memo here in Wichita Falls <laughs> because well, I, I didn't even know about it. I took my bike, excuse me, I took my bike out and I was going to Harbor Freights because I wanted to get uh, some double-sided sticky tape to put on my bike so I could put my new GoPro on there. And I pull up, it's packed. There's a line out the door and everyone's got their mask on. 
guess who didn't have a mask? Yeah. This guy. Because I didn't know. And everyone's <laughs> looking at me and I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to get on my bike and I'm going to ride out of here. A thousand, <laughs> it can be up to a thousand dollar fine without your mask on. So it's a, uh, it's crazy. But yes, yeah, we, the county, our, our county judge said, hey, we, we're going to open back up. We're back for business. And then the governor was like, no, not yet. So fortunately, we haven't been hard, hard hit here. But, you know, two deaths is too many. So it is anyway. Um, all right. Again, I hope everybody stays safe, stay well, and we will keep trying to bring this to you. Um, I, uh, I really enjoyed this tonight. I think that this turned out well. I wish it would have gone live, but we'll keep trying to push. I think we might need to change the time. We'll need to, I'm not going to say seven o'clock next Saturday yet. Maybe we no, need to maybe look a at some uh, earlier. I'll do or some stats. Later or, yeah. yeah, do some stats. Find out when a good time or maybe for even us to like live. Sunday or something. We'll see what's, you know, we'll, we'll see what, what happens there as far as, um, Sunday evening may be better than Saturday evening. I think as everybody's at home watching that, or maybe some people are getting up to go to work Monday, maybe. I don't know. Well, I'll look some stats and see when. Okay, find out. Or because. worse comes to worse, we still record at a time and then stream it live. Kind of like a, a YouTube premiere. Yeah. That's what those are, so. Who knows? We'll see. All righty. Well, I think that's about it. Again, I think you it can is. always find us at www.militaryparanormal.com. And Instagram. Yep. Facebook. There we go. I don't know what we've covered now, but all of us. You <laughs> can contact us at one nine four zero four three seven four six seven four or four MPI at and podcast can... at militaryparanormal dot com. There you go. And hopefully, if you are listening to this on our stream, you will find us at like, let's see, Twitch, Mob Crush. Facebook Live, YouTube, under your channel and my channel, and maybe my new channel. Who knows? Uh, Mixer, Twitch, D Live, which is actually Discord. Uh, you're gonna find us at Mob Crush, which is actually doing a lot of different ones, and then Periscope, which is actually Twitter. Even though I really haven't got that one working, yeah. But hey, I will. It's just gonna take me time. I'll get it working. Oh, okay. Boy, and happy birthday to yes, Jeff! Yes, happy birthday, yes. Jeff! Happy birthday, Jeff! I think that we'll close it here. We'll see you guys later. All right. Bye, y'all. Bye, y'all. Thank you for listening to the MPI Paranormal Podcast. This podcast has been brought to you by Military Paranormal Investigations. Hope you all enjoyed the show. Don't forget to connect with us on Podbean, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Until next time, the truth is to be found.